Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. I'm John Martin. And I'm Dean Reverman. Dean, uh, scanning has come a long way yes. in our life. You and I are old enough to have kind of experienced a lot of changes in technology over the years, right? This is true. We may yes. not want to claim that sometimes, but we yeah, have. But you know, yeah. I've yeah, yeah. been around the block. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So like scanning technologies, like I, I think of like like grocery stores. Yes. And you know, in the old days, it was just those big pass-through scanner things mm-hmm. that sometimes mm-hmm. they're ringing it five or six <laughs> times if the barcode wouldn't wasn't, work. Yeah, if yes. the barcode wasn't perfect, didn't work, and then they got to punch it in. Yes. Now yes. it seems a little more sophisticated. Yes. It's a little more easy to just, you know, you get yourself scanning. Yeah. Yep. You might have a scanner gun that they're using. Yeah, I've turned out to be a pretty good scanner myself. There beep, you go. Beep, yeah, beep, yeah, beep. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty quick and easy to do now. <laughs> but we've got, you got presentation scanners now. You've got mobile devices now, though. Yeah, you know? well, that's like, just it. They're everywhere now. Yeah, these things are equipped with some of the most powerful cameras yes. on the planet now. Yes. Which kind of fits into the whole scanning technology thing, too. It does. And that's our topic for the day. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the optics of scanning or scanning technologies, mm-hmm. where things are going, where mm-hmm. we are now, what to expect in the future how it might kind of impact uh, some various industries in our channel. Mm -hmm. We have Bruce Scharf with us today from uh, from Code. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about uh, about this topic. We're going to get into kind of a history of the scanning technologies, probably better than what I explained right there. There you go. Uh, We're going to talk (laughs) about how how these smartphones are kind of impacting the business Mm because people may want to try to use those instead Mm -hmm. of using purpose-built devices. Yeah, but there's issues there. Yeah, That's Mm -hmm. right. Uh, We're going to talk about what kind of scanning technologies he's excited about, what Mm -hmm. he's keeping an eye on, Mm -hmm. uh, some of the freebie crap that's out there that is probably not as free, free. and useful as yes. you think it's going to yes. be, yes. and where we go from here. All of that, plus our usual, uh, what's tech connecting with us and uh, value to the VAR. It's time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. It's time to get connected. All right, as I mentioned, our guest today, Bruce, is it Sharf or Scarf? I forgot to ask you before the show. It's Sharf. Sharf. Okay, I got it right. I figured I did. Uh, he is the VP of Products for Code Corporation. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and and kind of you know how you got into this world of code and scanning and optics. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. And um, I guess my history is I go back. I'm an optical engineer by trade, um, so that was my education. I uh, worked at um, the track trace and control industry, uh, basically barcoding for most of my career now. And uh, it was kind of a great combination. It was that renaissance, if you will, of optics in you know imaging, as you had mentioned. Cameras have come a very long way uh, very quickly with the introduction of smartphones. So it's been a fun ride. No doubt. Yeah. Okay. So optical engineer, like we always talk about the fact that the people we have on this show are better experts, obviously, than anything that yes. we can ever be. Yes. I think we hit the nail on the head with this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Optical engineering, not uh, not in my uh, you know, realm of expertise, no, for sure. No, not at all, which is why we're going to lean pretty heavily on you for yes. this conversation. Yes. It's all you, Bruce. No no pressure. <laughs> right. We're just going to kick back, just talk about what you want to for the next hour. Uh, so let's let's start off then with, I kind of hinted at this history of, you know, of scanning technologies yeah. and kind of- How did we get here? Yeah. How do we get to where we are right now? So give us a, your kind of a rundown of, of where we've been and, and where we are right now. Well, it uh, did start, you know, I think sometime in the 70s with uh, that first pack of Wrigley's gum that was scanned. I believe it was someplace in Ohio. Ohio, yes. It was a store in Ohio. That's right. Yep. Exactly. So anyway, and that was typically a laser uh, just being swept across the barcode. Um, And that worked for many, many years. And then uh, eventually the uh, one-dimensional imagers came out, which was just an array of photo sensors that could take a picture, if you will. Uh, That worked for a while as well. But then when people wanted to increase the amount of information that was presented in the code, the barcodes got really, really long. And so what we had to do was invent those two-dimensional codes. Well, once that happened, then you needed that two-dimensional sensor or basically a camera. And that worked for a very long time and it still works today. It's just now we can do an awful lot more things with those cameras specifically uh, with the smartphone cameras because uh, smartphones have really driven the performance and, and quality of those images we get now. 
And so really, you feel it's complicit, you know, the fact that everybody has this camera in their pocket uh, and the ability to do that has had kind of a dramatic effect on on where you sit from an engineering standpoint on uh, uh, things that are being developed and, and how they're being used? Yes. So um, a lot of stuff that you couldn't even consider doing really, really small codes that you mm. suddenly can can read to, you know, codes that are very far away. Um, there's just a whole bunch of opportunities now. Multiple codes in the same field of view because you can have a large field of view. Um, there's just a lot more things you can do with that camera technology. And I guess, does that start getting into 3D? Uh, you know, you, you, you hear the term 3D codes, you know, when, when you get into QR codes, stuff like that. I think everybody has a grasp of 1D and 2D barcodes, but 3D, it's not really a three-dimensional code, right? It's, it's that it's a little just, box sticking out of the back of the code, yeah. A <laughs> little box that's got, you know, <laughs> texture to it and stuff like that. It, it's not that at all, but is that kind of where you're going or because you can pack a lot more information uh, via the optics? Well, it, it's interesting you should mention that. And one of the things I was going to talk about, one of the um, interesting technologies that I see out there in imaging is LIDAR technology. Mm. And yes, there is such a thing as a three-dimensional code where you can have um, the depths of uh, something represent additional information. So it's not only light and dark, but now what is the depth? And with LIDAR, you can actually start measuring those depths now. It's not there yet because LIDAR is currently really focused on the automated, you know, the autonomous car and autonomous vehicle market to, to measure distance. But once you are able to measure that distance, it's probably only a matter of time before the resolution and the sensitivity says, yes, you could probably do a three-dimensional barcode. Yeah, I like how when you were talking about kind of the history and you mentioned like, and that worked for a while, and that worked for a while, <laughs> and that worked for a while, because isn't that what progress and technology right. is all about? It's like, yeah, yeah, you yeah, get yeah. to that point where at some point you got to go, all right, this just isn't working with what we're going to do anymore. And I think in this particular instance, what we're talking about here, it's it's all about data. Yes, information. You know, we, we're yep. such a data-driven world and mm -hmm. an analysis-driven world, and we want mm -hmm. to have as much data at our fingertips as possible. And I think, you know, because I know we think of barcoding, we think of either supply chain or we often think of like grocery retail. Mm -hmm. And I know like in the grocery world, especially like mm -hmm. how important has it become to be able to get as much information as possible about a product, either on the consumer side of things to know like the ingredients and nutritional information or on the supply side of things to identify, you know, how much you have, if it's past it's used by life, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so much data. Yeah, you, eventually barcodes would have been just like, you know, sticking off the edge of a product, you know, right. half a mile long <laughs> <laughs> if you kept it the old way. You had to make some changes there. So so then let's talk about this idea that, you know, that, that, that barcode scanning is, has typically been the task of these kind of dedicated readers. But as mm -hmm. we've talked about already mm -hmm. and mentioned mm -hmm. several times, these modern smartphones, modern devices have these increasingly sophisticated cameras that can do amazing stuff that, you know, even just leaps and bounds over 10 years ago, yep. you know, cameras so true. did. Yeah. How is that kind of changing the way you and Code are approaching selling scanners and talking about imagers and, and dedicated mobile devices? Because I'm sure you encounter plenty of people that say, well, my phone can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But is it overkill, right? If you have a situation where you just need to read a code and put it into your ERP system, you know, to, to track your inventory, as you said, then do you really need that, all of that power? And the answer is probably not. Um, and, you know, one thing that you have to look at as well is it is mobile, uh, which is good, but that means it can also sort of grow legs and walk out the door, which can be bad. So um, it's trade-offs that you have to do. So it's very application specific. Generally speaking, if the code is coming to the scanner, it's usually a dedicated scanning system and that's the best approach. If you have to go to the code, then you generally would want some more of a mobile solution and possibly a, a smartphone or a smart camera would be better there. What are some of those applications, though, that you're seeing an increased need for data? I mean, because, to, John, to your point, I mean, it's it's gone beyond the grocery store. I mean, right, the use right. of uh, in, in logistics, honestly. I mean, you're starting to see it in QSR and restaurants for menus, uh, you know, doing quick links and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a need for a little bit more information there. Healthcare, of course, is one of those verticals that continues to, to boom in the whole barcoding 
uh, world, but there is some demands there too. And I know codes are very heavily involved in the healthcare industry. Uh, maybe talk a little bit there about what you're seeing there and how it affects you from a, from a product standpoint. Right. So you're, you're quite correct with the um, electronic, you know, health records now where you have all of the data of everything that's been, you know, done to you in your health records. You, you need that increased information um, and basically creating a comprehensive record of your past health history. So barcoding is one of the easiest ways to do that. You scan the, the medicine that you were just given, you the test that you were taking, any sort of uh, blood work that needed to be done. It's just so much more efficient to automate that and to have the results automatically uploaded into the electronic you know, record rather than having them printed out and then having you know, the doctor read them and then someone transcribed them into a system. It's just made things a lot easier. But in, and in more the, accurate. there you go. Yes. And accuracy is obviously very critical. Especially in, in, in healthcare. healthcare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A yeah. little, little bit. I want to go back <laughs> to LIDAR real quick, you know, because I, I think that's kind of a fascinating technology and I'd love to get your input or, or help me understand a little bit more. So you can get so much information on a 1D barcode, right? Uh, well, depending on the length of it, of course, right. <laughs> but in reason. How much time you want to spend scanning right. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then you got 2D barcode, which you can stuff more information onto that. How how exponentially more would LIDAR, do you think, or what, what are we talking here, Bruce? Is that is that 10 times more information that you're going to be able to get on that QR code uh, once you can have that, that depth? Or is it going to be that kind of revolutionary? Or is it even more? What do you think? Um, it, it will depend on... Okay. The application and, uh, as I mentioned, the accuracy of the LIDAR and the sensitivity is one thing, but at the same token, you don't want to have a, an object, you know, say your candy bar or whatever, and then you have this big thick thing sticking out on top of it because you have, you know, this piece of plastic that had to be etched uh, at various ways. So um, I think it'll probably be in the two to three times as much. When okay. you look at um, you know, uh, direct part marking and that sort of technology where you just do a little bit of an etch on metal or um, you, know, you dot peen a part, I think there, if you can vary the depths and have, say, two or three different levels, I think that'll probably be the most practical. And we're talking about something that would be yeah. at almost like a like a very small, like maybe not microscopic, but a, an extremely small level where you're not not something that's going to be super visible, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's a very nice application as well. Um, yeah. When we talk about the camera technology and getting more and more pixels, that allows you to you know do smaller and smaller codes and still be able to decode them. But at some point, we have to remember that the real application of those cameras are for uh, taking pictures and video and, you know, interacting visually. And at some point, you're taking a higher resolution image than your eye can perceive. So why would you spend the cost and the energy to do that? So I think once the cameras get to that level of re resolution, then we're going to see, because there's the it's more need for more data continuously, then we're going to need to do some other things like, you know, three-dimensional codes, uh, those sorts of things. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, you, all right, you've, you've talked about LIDAR, you know, already. Are there any other types of scanning technologies that are kind of, you know, in development or coming down the road that have you really pumped and excited? I mean, as an optical engineer, I'm sure this is the kind of thing where you pay attention to this stuff as it happens. So what's what's got you geeking out right now? <laughs> Um, let's see, geeking out, obviously, the augmented reality aspects of mm -hmm. the scanning technology, um, where you, you know, look at a scene and, you know, a data closet and you open it up and you can actually see what components may need to be replaced, preventive maintenance, all of that stuff is, is presented to you, usually via, you know, a record that's stored in a barcode, could be RFID, but, um, I think that is exciting. I do also like the fact that uh, the cameras now on the high-end cell phones actually have multiple cameras, and then they stitch together, if you will, an image that has a huge depth of focus. Um, so that's a, a really powerful tool as well. I remember in the old days of scanning, as you mentioned, you know, when you tried to 
push it by the uh, uh, can of soda by the scanner multiple times to get it to read. Uh, there was always that you had to try to get it right in the sweet spot of the scanner. Mm -hmm. Now with this technology, there's you know the, the sweet spot is huge, um, and that's I guess both a good thing and possibly a bad thing because now if you have multiple barcodes in what you're looking at, which one is of interest, right? Um, and I think right now what people have to do on the smartphone anyway is they do the tap, right? This is the area of interest that I have, and that's where the phone focuses its, its attention. Well, um, again, with LiDAR, there's a possibility, and I don't think this has been demonstrated yet, where you could actually do eye tracking a lot more accurately. So then when you're looking at the image, if there's multiple barcodes, you just look at the one that you're interested in and the camera will be able to tell that automatically. That's so that's got me kind of geeking out as well in terms of not having to do the double tap to focus, you know, where you're interested in on the camera. Yeah. And, and I think that what I've seen on the AR side, going back to the AR, and, and if you can, you know, yeah, if somebody can visually, let's say you have a, a stocking clerk or whatever uh, that's going through the grocery store and, and restocking and mm -hmm. they focus in on the barcode that of the empty product or whatever right, it right. is. And that instantly looks up how many are in the back or something like that. I mean, that's that's the kind of efficiencies, I think, that maybe where you're going, Bruce, where, you know, when you combine some of these technologies with, with what is happening in optics, there's that's cool stuff you know that's the ability to really kind of take the whole thing to the next level with augmented reality that is then is based on some of those you know some of those things that were traditionally around barcode scanning uh, but enabling that whole process yeah you know i'm really fascinated right now too by these apps and amazon is a, a big example that i can think of because i've mm. used it many times that kind of do almost the inverse where instead of presenting something to you like showing you something in the ar field it's more of Hey, take a picture of something and we will be able to identify what that something is and give you and show you something. So like, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I, I wanted to get a new paintbrush for, you know, uh, for to seal my deck. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I had my old one and it was all frattered and tates, you know, fr and frattered mm -hmm. up and everything, you know, just not in good shape anymore. So I grabbed Amazon and I was like, I don't know exactly what to look up for this. because There's no like barcode or anything on it. I was like, oh, they've got that little, you know, app thing. You can just take a picture and like this little star field almost appears and like shows dots. Oh, everywhere. I have not used this yet. Yeah. And it just, it'll, and it will literally find that in, in the store or at least find something similar. Like it couldn't find the exact one, but it was like, hey, here's like six other paintbrushes where I've really seen them use it also. I think it's when I discovered it was a couple Christmases ago. We got their like toy catalog. Mm -hmm. And when you're going through the toy catalog, you can literally just open up your app and turn on the camera port of it and it will scan the image in the catalog and, and it's not like it's the barcode or in there's no qr code there it's literally looking at the image itself mm -hmm. and takes you directly to that product link in their store i just that, to me that's fascinating that is, i love that you yeah. can do that so. so bruce what's your what's your take then on the back end you know so the uh, the optics are one thing the camera technology but in order to enable what you were just talking about that's some software oh yeah you know the, figuring that out in ai uh, is that is that keeping pace AI you know, with, with the camera technology at this point? Um, I, I think it's, it is uh, uh, maybe a little bit behind. I think it's one of those stories of you first have like the PC, right? It gave you more memory and faster processor and then the software would use it. And <laughs> so then they had to create a more memory and a faster processor. So I think they're symbiotic. And so I think that the imaging technology is, is required first. And then depending upon that, the software and the AI and the deep learning can take advantage of that and push the limit. And then it, that will drive where the next uh, generation optics goes. Um, that could be one thing that continues to drive the resolution of uh, cameras up because even if the human eye can't perceive it, the AI and the deep learning can. And, you know, maybe 50 years in the future, the barcode will be gone because during production and inventory and everything, you just see the object. And because like snowflakes, no two are alike, regardless of how good production is, no two are going to be exactly alike. You can probably uniquely identify them. 
but that's a long way off. Yeah, there's a lot of people that just got yeah. panicked when you said, if the barcode goes away, when, or when the barcode goes away. <laughs> but to your point, you know, you got to move forward. Well, you know, it's just going to be different. You right, know, maybe exactly. maybe it's 40 or 5. I don't know what right, it right. is, but 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 that's so true. And I was thinking to myself as you were talking, well, of course, the, the camera technology is just going to keep advancing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just go back to the $6 million man. I mean, we, everybody <laughs> wants the eye where they can zoom two miles away yeah, yeah. and see with great detail detail whatever whatever yeah. you know, whatever detail the, they were looking the for the next there. camera will be us yeah <laughs> <laughs> but well, the software needs to be able to you know manage that it, it does, and, yes. and consume the information and uh present it back to us humans in, 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 right. in a meaningful way yeah right that's yeah. where things get tricky it's, i think yeah that's true right the the next thing is not going to be wearables it's going to be implantable. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I really do think optics is going to be one of those that, that is really going to just keep moving forward a very fast pace. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, Bruce, let's talk about, uh, we've, you know, we've banded a lot about the idea of like actual, our actual smartphones, the consumer devices mm -hmm. that have all these fantastic cameras. I saw a roll off. What is it? The iPhone 13 is the next one that's coming out yep. or has come mm -hmm. out. And, you know, they're showing like the rack focusing and all this stuff. And like, you can I'm not film even, a movie. Yeah. I'm not even a photographer. <laughs> I mean, they were already filming movies, you but can now be a you director can, like, of photography. You can do then. like the right. legit, some of the legit camera work, you know, right. tricks or whatever there. But, you know, I, I did a campaign with Code a year or two back uh, where we were focusing on, you know, talking to healthcare about a Cortex decoder. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the talking points that was in that ebook when I was doing my research about it was that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of free barcoding apps that are out there yep. that you can use on a personal device. But, and this is part of the reason why you guys created Cortex Decoder is an understanding that that may not be good enough for, for what they're using there. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, you know, if someone's thinking like, well, I can go get free apps that do the kind of scanning that I need to do or that can pick up barcode symbology, that's good enough, right? Why is that not the case? Well, I guess there's two adages to sort of describe that. Uh, the first one is you get what you pay for, right? So, um, you know, the, the speed of which you can decode, the number of symbologies that you can decode will be limited. You know, the speed will be slow in the free apps typically. And um, you may not be able to read damaged codes um, or oftentimes even worse, you might up, wind up with a substitution, meaning that it decodes what was not encoded. And that can be, you know, a very bad thing. So, First adage, you get what you pay for. And then the second adage, which you alluded to a little earlier, which is there is no such thing as a free lunch. Um, so while it may be free, you need to wonder, well, what are they collecting? Is there some sort of analytics? Are they copying the data that's being scanned? Are they you know, doing something? And what is, you know, what is, what is in it for them? Uh, so there are free apps out there, but I know one in particular where it was implemented into a product and it actually contained malware and some, you know, tens of thousands of devices were infected. So uh, be very cautious, I would say, about using, you know, those free apps. That, that's it, Bruce. And I was going to, I'm glad you brought up the last one there because I was going to read that article that it just happened in, in early 2021. One of the most prominent cases of barcode scanning app containing malware occurred and so this popular barcode scanning app they didn't name what it was uh, but it infected 10 million android users wow. and what it did was you know the barcode scanner started displaying ads that would then open up the user's default browser even if they didn't want, mean to do that and it started inviting them to download other you know, browser updates, right. which was just more malware going on to it. Google caught on to it and they eventually shut it down. But, you know, not in the case of the 10 million people, right, 10 right. million app users that were that were utilizing. So that's a, a really good point, especially in the Android universe that yep. is not quite as locked down, obviously, as Apple is. Uh, Got to be careful. But but as solutions integrators, you also have to make sure your customers are aware of this type of thing. I mean, who would have thought that? Right, Bruce? I mean, the malware one is like, exactly. that's, that's a huge alarm, if you ask me. I, I would agree. To me, that one's the number one. And then the number two is the quality and the risk of a substitution and getting the wrong data. That's it. Yeah, that's which, it. it again, it, going back to healthcare, which, you know, is where Cortex Decoder kind of fits in. Like, that's a place you just don't want to mess up. Oh, my Lord. Like, you don't want to give the wrong type of medication. You don't want to give the wrong dosage of medication. You don't want to record that somebody got something when they didn't or... 
God forbid, a test result or something, you know, that you go call somebody up and say they've got cancer. And in reality, that was someone else's result. That's the kind of stuff that if you're if you're playing loose with your technology can can go down oh, a bad path. And, and can you imagine the headlines in the newspaper oh, yeah. if you implement a solution that has one of these whatever, un, I'll just call it an unvetted <laughs> barcoding scanning app right. in the healthcare environment and come to find out that it's been extracting that data and selling it on the dark oh, web yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. my Lord. Yep. Yeah. I mean, forget it. You, yeah. Yeah. You, you have to be protective there. Yeah. Well, Bruce, let me throw you sort of a little curveball. I didn't have this on the cue sheet, but, you know, we talk a lot. Obviously, our our industry is built on purpose-built devices, you know. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. I know, you know, that, that you know, we do have people that play with, you know, again, like Cortex Decoder, with software and some stuff that can be used in conjunction with a personal device in order to, you know, kind of bump that up to where a purpose-built might be. But, you know, our a lot of our VARs live in the mobile computer world and the scanner world. And, you know, how are, how are you having those conversations with them? Are, are any of them coming to you and saying, hey, I'm a little scared because I keep seeing these these consumer devices getting better and better and the cameras are getting better and better. I'm worried people are going to start turning away from purpose-built devices. Is that happening? Are you hearing that at all? Um, we're not really. So it's, it's there's clearly, you know, the, the purpose-built devices will always probably perform better for that intended function. It's, you know, the, the mobile smartphones are still primarily, well, <laughs> they used to be a phone that would take <laughs> a picture, but they are really primarily designed around, you know, video and photos and, well, texting more so. I don't know that anyone really has a phone conversation. On and now phone. they're now right. they're just a computer that may make a phone call if you feel like yes, it. If you're exactly. into that sort of thing. Voice? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's, that's, go ahead, Bruce. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Built devices still have a place. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I definitely think they do. And, and, you know, to me, I'm not, I'm not afraid of that, that because, you know, you're, you're getting bigger market growth when people utilize, uh, you know, consumer uh, Mm -hmm. type devices, because I know, and statistically, I think this is proven, although I don't have the statistic and no, it's not bro science. I I really think this is, this is correct. Uh, And because you can look at some use cases, there are some large, there's a large box um, home improvement retailer out there that implemented uh, consumer grade devices, bought tens of thousands of them mm-hmm. to to enable their um, associates on the floor. Gone, you know that didn't last very wow. long. They went to purpose built devices. Now uh, I just heard that Walmart announced that I think they're they're implementing eight hundred thousand Samsung devices to enable their associates on the on the floor i'm really interested in that one because it's not a purpose-built device you know they're using a consumer brand device and right I, i'm wondering about that play but kind of where bruce w- or, or what i would say is that you know i think that that even if you lose a deal if you will do a consumer grade device stay with it yeah hang around <laughs> hang around because eventually they're just they're just not built for the environment yeah. when, period or for the or even the life i mean just you right. know, i mean how right. often have you had to change phones I yeah mean, Yes. Yeah, it's it's not what it's designed to do, uh, and I think more and more actually, our society. You know, it used to be kind of cool to talk about. Oh yeah, well my phone can do so much stuff. Right, but if right. you're a worker in a in an environment, you don't want to have to deal with you know all the things that can go wrong on your consumer device right. and trying to get it get a purpose built built device. I know that's what we preach, but the rest of the world is slowly going through the process of understanding. Yeah, this thing's pretty whiz bang as as it deals with me as a person, but. When me as a worker or trying to get stuff done, yep. let's go purpose built. Yep. Yeah. You know, and beyond that also, we've, and we've talked about this when we've discussed Android before and the idea of being able to have control over what all the devices that your people are using are doing. Oh, yeah. Or you give them a bunch of personal devices mm-hmm. that they can use as personal devices mm-hmm. too if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. Then you have just a hodgepodge of people that are doing different things, downloading different types of apps. Maybe they're upgrading at different times to different types of software or different OSs. You just, it's, it's too much of a headache. You don't want that. You don't want that, the potential calamities and liabilities that could come out of that because you've got 50 workers that, you know, 25 could be using this version, 20, this version, <laughs> yeah. four of them have never updated at yeah. all. IT and, nightmare. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and the last one, you know, lost it down a sewer drain and didn't tell you who knows. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. well, uh, Bruce, then let's, let's wrap up. You know, I, I think we've kind of talked a little bit about this and hinted at this already, but you know, where do you think that scanning technology is going from here? What's, what's next? What should we be thinking about when we look ahead five, 10, 15, 20 years? Wow. So um, 
Five years, the short term, I would say we're going to see higher resolution. We will, I think, see that augmented reality and um, where those applications come into play. Uh, when we talked a little bit about the 50 year plan where maybe items are identified just by themselves that that deep learning and that AI will be taking the image and working with it more so than a barcode or a QR code. Um, so it's going to be, I think it's going to be a fun ride. It will be. And, and you're starting to see a little bit of that. The last one there. I mean, I, I thought I re was reading an article on a, a key or a robot that's being tested in a retail environment mm -hmm. where you, you just walk up because it, in the home improvement store is, is the use case, right? How many times have you walked in, whatever, you got to repair your toilet and you've, you've got the part that you right, need. So right. you walk yep. in yep. and you go back to the plumbing. I need this. And, but that person's not you're looking there. At those giant shelves yeah, that are just right, filled with 6 right. billion items. Yeah. But if you just let the camera capture it and this is where you're going, Bruce, right? Where it just, it recognizes the part yeah. just off the optics and says, oh yeah, we got something that's where you were yep. with your amazon app yep. uh so I, yeah I, that seems intuitive that we're kind of heading somewhat in I that agree. direction yeah. i'm i'm very excited to see what we can finally do with ar i feel like it's one of those things we've been talking about for so long yeah and it's made little appearances you mm -hmm. know in video games and other random little places where people have found to use ar but i i really want to see it's i and i know it's going to happen and bruce to your point i think it is going to be in the next few years somebody's going to figure out a way to make a practical use for that that's just going to start changing the game well, it's going to open the doors and everybody's going to go man we can do that too absolutely i think the form factor isn't going to be as sexy as it was rolled out initially no. like google glass was basically <laughs> glasses nice glasses and they tried to pack a lot into it but right. it just didn't work whereas the reality is i don't know i'm going to call it a covid you know man you know the the, the shield, the shield that people yeah. were, <laughs> you know it's just the piece of plastic that wraps around your yep, head yep. that's probably a, a little bit more applicable to yeah. how we could view AR that right now yep. and you need a battery pack and it's not sexy and you probably need a cord <laughs> going from your headset down to a little mobile device right, to right. do some of the computing power there but that's okay we'll get there if Eventually, we do that, it'll just be a chip in our brain you know well, yeah we got to start here with right. this and then we can laugh 30 years down the road oh remember those big yep, face shields yep. you had to wear yep. yeah well that's how our AR looked in the 2020s exactly <laughs> just like the people who laugh at us when we talk about landlines you know so <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, before we get to our recurring segments, I want to, as always, thank our sponsors of TechNet. We always appreciate your support. Thank you so much to Code for sponsoring a couple episodes this season and lending us Bruce today. Yes. Uh, as always, if you want to connect with us, if you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, what you think about the show, if you have questions about scanning technology, topics that you want us to get to at some point, reach out to us. You can find us on Twitter at TechConnectPod. You can also email us TechConnect at BlueStarInc.com. All right, so let's let's wrap up first with value to the VAR. And I, this is one of those ones where I feel like we've given you the value a lot of it all along the way, sprinkled it in, mm -hmm. but let's kind of package it up here. So, so Bruce, you know, when we think about verticals that are really impacted by scanning technologies, I know we've talked a lot about healthcare, we've talked a lot about supply chain, retail, grocery, but maybe as you're thinking ahead to some of these newer technologies like AR, LiDAR, maybe eliminating barcodes altogether at some point in the future and just going with images, what verticals do you think are going to be most impacted by these changes as they come about? So in the, the history, it was really you, you tracked something and you traced its pedigree, right? That was what barcoding did. Um, now it's uh, getting into that, you know, fourth generation manufacturing, you know, manufacturing 4.0, you know, that track trace and control. So now it's, you know, looking ahead as to what we should be doing. And, and it's, one of the things that the code talks about is, you know, empowering intelligent decisions through data capture. So I think as the imaging advances, as we get more uh, data from different sources, that really what we extract from that data is going to be an awful lot of value to the customer. So the, the, the value to the VAR is going to be looking at, you know, not just the data, but the intelligence that it can provide us and, and the information to help us make decisions as to what happens next. Uh, so that to me is very exciting. And, and that's a good one. You know, that's forward thinking that that that's where we're going, you know, certainly uh, in the future. I'll throw on the table that one that I keep hearing getting talked about a lot around Blue Star and when I interact with resellers and whatnot. Uh, 
you know, the whole concept of reshoring, right? And this is all around supply mm. chain. Supply chain is just a disaster right now, right. right? So so there's a lot of thought about bringing some of the manufacturing back here uh, into the States or reshoring it, as it's called. So that, which is all well and good, but a lot of these small manufacturers, as you and I have talked about mm -hmm. a lot, are still on paper or pencil <laughs> yeah. or using Excel for a lot of their data collection right, kind of right. a thing. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I bring that up to say don't don't poo poo the the one D two D technology that's out there because there is a lot of ginormous universe right. that could really use that technology. They're not even that far yet. Yeah, they're not. And, and baby we, steps. If, if we're going to reshore some of this manufacturing, oh my gosh, it's going to be very complicit. And so when you look at it, I think that that's why they're saying what a, the global two D barcode reader market is going to uh, continue to grow at a pace of greater than eight uh, percent over the next couple of years. And I would say even more than that, if you really, truly do bring a lot of this manufacturing back in, yep. you got to be able to track and trace it for crying out loud. So yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. You know, I think also we, you know, we, we talked about healthcare quite a bit. And yeah, oh, that's a big one. Yeah. I, I think, you know, there's this world that we all have been dreaming of for, it feels like 20, 30 years now of the whole electronic health record being a, mm. a unified health record that follows you from place to place. You know, and uh, you know, we're, I know in this area where I am here in Northern Kentucky, we're kind of spoiled a bit. We've got a healthcare system that kind of dominates here. So it's, it's a little easier to be mm -hmm. interconnected, you know, when you move mm -hmm. around from place to place. But in many places, people go to, you know, one doctor for this, another doctor for that, a specialist for this, a hospital for that. And Different none systems. of them, yeah, yeah, none of them are connected in any way. Right. And that can be very dangerous. You know, oh, like yeah. we, you need to know like what a patient has done in one place in order to treat them properly in another. And I, I you know, I think as we develop this scanning technology, maybe get a little better at it. Hopefully that's something that can enable it. And there's a lot bigger picture, a lot more stuff that has to happen to sure, get us sure. to that point. But I think, you know, as hopefully as we improve the way we're able to scan and pull in data and track data and, and very quickly and easily grab information and attach it to, you know, a person, their file or whatever, I'm hoping that makes that easier as you go down the road. It too. certainly would be nice, wouldn't it? It would. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good Lord. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's wrap up, as always, with our favorite segment, What's Tech Connecting With You? This is where we get to talk about something from the world of science, innovation, technology. It's got yep. our attention. is yep. caught our eye this week. Bruce, what is tech connecting with you right now? Uh, a couple of areas. One, energy storage. And I don't mean batteries. There's a oh. lot of oh. stuff going on there. Um, so keeping an eye on that. A little closer to home in the, the, the data uh, capture. Uh, believe it or not, more of an older technology, which is near-field communication. Um, been thinking about that a lot lately, and remember that it all started with that old, you know, tap your cell phones together to exchange, you know, your phone numbers and your contact details, and that really didn't go anywhere. And now, of course, it's more ubiquitous with the tap to pay. But I really think that there's a way for um, some very interesting applications using that technology that can complement uh, the barcode and the scanning technology that uh, it's kind of got me thinking quite a bit. Now, I'm going back to the energy storage part. You, you know, where, where you, you talked about batteries. I've before, talked about yeah. batteries. So if it's not a battery, help me out here. Where are we storing it? What, like in limestone caves? But how are we storing it? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a couple of them. They're, they're kind of interesting. Obviously, the one that's been around forever is or is the whole water right you pump water uphill and then at ah. night you move it through a turbine downhill right but that uh there's another one that there's a large scale one where it's basically huge uh, i don't know if you want to call them concrete blocks and a crane lifts the concrete blocks up with the energy and then when it needs it it lowers them down also takes a whole lot of space gotcha uh, then the other one that i thought was kind of interesting is uh, basically, it, it's much more compact, but it uses um, a ceramic and then a whole bunch of basically toaster heating coils. And you basically superheat the ceramic. And then when you need the energy, the ceramic cools and you have arrays of, of you know, conversion cells that put it back to electricity. So nice. it says, and, and who knows what's actually going to win, but uh, That's cool. I like the ones that are maybe a little simpler and maybe don't rely on some exotic materials that are yeah. you know, so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. That gets 
back to the engineer and me, you know, engineers are real right. cheap. So <laughs> there you go. What's cheaper than gravity, by the way? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. come on. How do we harness that in? It's not going anywhere. Hey, sometimes Forget Mother Nature has the best solutions. Yes. You know? Gravity. Yeah. I love that. Yep. Anything gravity. All right. So I got one for you. Okay. Let's hear it. In mouse experiments, scientists unlock the key to scar free skin healing. I, I thought this was kind of interesting because okay. I've got a couple scars on my body, you know, through mm -hmm. the years yeah. being a kid yeah. and whatnot. But now research researchers at Stanford have decoded the chemical and physical signals that trigger a particular type of skin cell that produces that scar. That I did not know, okay. by the way. So it, it is a chemical uh, type of a thing. Uh, but they've discovered a way to reprogram those cells, transforming them into another cell type capable of regenerating the tissue intact. So I'm Pretty telling cool. you, we're going to be like bionic people. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not that far away. Scars, no problem. Right, Can right. you imagine now going in into uh, uh, whatever the cosmetology, no, what do they call those surgeons that do cosmetic yeah, surgery? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, now we've got instead of a chemical peel or something like right. that, you'd probably be able to have this reprogramming of your cells to wipe away those scars. Yeah. But in all seriousness, I, that would seriously but have the scars an impact. remind us that the past is real. Oh, fair enough. Yes. <laughs> a little, little, little music quote out there for anybody who wants to get that one. So. <laughs> but I, I was, know, you know, I was fascinating by that I headline. Mean, I'm like, I oh, can yeah, see okay. that being like a big deal for someone. Like if you've got like, you know, bad scarring on your face or something. Well, yeah. You know, like you were in a car you know, accident or, yeah, or something like fire that. Or something like that. I could, there's yeah, yeah, fire. obviously some amazing applications. Yes. But I could also see it getting down to the nitty gritty of like, this will be just another, another version of the facelift or, yes. you know, the, yes. the collagen injection or whatever. <laughs> just like, you know, like, well, I got a little nick behind my ear back here and I don't like that. I want it to be perfect. You know? Yes. So, yes. Come yes. On, you know? Make me look like whoever. Right. Right. But no, that's, that's an awesome. And yeah, awesome I thought it was a pretty good one. Yeah. Yep. So like, what's that connecting with you? All right. So, you know, space is a, kind of a dangerous place. Dangerous. You know, we all think it's really fun and big. cool, but it's pretty dangerous, all things considered. Well, it gets even more dangerous when rogue countries are blowing up satellites and you're in orbit, right? What happened? Russia blows up a satellite, creating a dangerous debris cloud in space. The field <laughs> of debris may be passing by the International Space Station. Oh, Lord. This was actually from a few days back. So yes. Russia was apparently Wait, hold testing Hold on, time out. out. Or did they blow up their own? Okay. They were, they were testing out a ground-based missile for destroying satellites. And they blew up one of their old satellites, I guess, that had been sitting up there for a while. Okay. And now, mind you, there were Russian cosmonauts on the space station while this was while they did this. It created this giant debris cloud that apparently was moving rapidly around the Earth because it's in orbit now. Oh, sure. And they were like basically like they went into some emergency protocols on the, the International Space Station to kind of lock down, wondering if it was going to potentially impact the station. I don't think anything did happen. What are these people doing? I, I mean, it's like, first of all, like interesting for them to be, you know, trying this out. Like, what's the flex here? I don't know, you know, but like, <laughs> we I can guess, blow up satellites. Uh, I guess so. Okay. You know, I guess that's what they're trying to show off. But like, it's yeah. pretty bold to do that when your own people are up there and potentially can be in danger because of it. So. <laughs> oh, what? but they care for their people. Yeah. Yes, don't, yes, yes. don't tell my wife about this. She's already said that if my kid ever gets interested in going to space, she's going to shut that down because she, she just, uh. she's terrified of the idea of anybody going to space and how dangerous they can Running be. Running so. into junk. Yeah, we've yeah, well, talked it, a little bit about space junk. It made me think junk. of that uh, Gravity movie, that one that came out ah, you know, yes. with uh, Sandra Bullock years yes. ago. That was all just debris. Debris. That ripped up, you know, and, yep. and even this tiniest little, yep. like just a little screw can be dangerous enough at a high speed floating around in space. Going 17,000 miles an hour? Yeah. 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 To punch a hole go in through a space stuff. station. Yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> space is dangerous enough. Clean up the space. <laughs> exactly. That does it for us. It is time for us to unplug Bruce Sharp from Code. Thank you so much Thanks, for joining Bruce. us today. We appreciate having you on. Thanks for having me. Uh, until next time, uh, maybe don't blow up any satellites before you yeah, check and see that. if someone else is around. And please stay connected. The CR2700 is Code's fourth generation Bluetooth 5 barcode scanner combining nearly 20 years of market experience with new features to improve the workflow in any setting from medical to retail environments. Available in both light and dark gray, Code has taken their unparalleled scanning performance and stepped it up a notch, tackling even more damaged and poorly printed barcodes to keep your business moving. Additionally, the CR2700 is now available in a FIPS 140-2 certification option. This government validation of robust data encryption is yet another reason why the CR2700 is a market leader. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star representative.